we're going to get started. Wow, what a great turnout. Thank you all for coming. You beat the storm. So we already had our meeting. Meeting's adjourned. Thanks for coming. No, we did jump ahead with our board meeting uh, because nobody wants to sit through a board meeting. And really what we did is we, we, we are allowed as a board to vote for our board members. We, we don't have to do it through a membership. We changed that years ago because you never had enough people here. So thank you, Senator Bumstead, for coming. If he wasn't here, maybe we'd just have two people like we normally have. <laughs> Thanks. It was the big retainer fee. I, well, I, know, I'll get, I, know, I know I'll get the bill. But anyway, I'm going to introduce our new board. I'm, I'm going to stay on for, as president unless somebody else wants to take that position. Okay. Mark Tromley, who was our secretary, he's now secretary treasurer. Sue Savoy, who's been with us for years, Sue has just been fabulous. Uh, she, she's, she's in charge of our membership, and she goes out on all of our testing. I don't think she ever missed one time, one time when we were out testing. Debbie Hayes, my wife, communications. <clears throat> Sometimes they say it's a no-no when you have a spouse on the board, um, but we don't have anybody else that wants to be on the board. So. Chelsea, um, who's been a chairperson for our sampling, she's fabulous. She handles all of our sampling. We've been brought her on the board. We're going to come up with some fancy title, but now it's just Chelsea Water Sampling. <laughs> Terry Tromley is going to be our chair. She's going to handle all the financials, and you can do that. She's going to handle the financials, but her husband, and I think that's okay, he's going to, <laughs> he's going to be responsible for the financials. We'll work it out. <laughs> This is Elaine Harsh. She's been our treasurer for years and years. She took us from having a little bit of money to having a, a, a nice, a nice fund. Thank you. She's just done a great job. Um, she's tried to resign four or five times now and wouldn't let her. Uh, thanks, thanks for your service. You've just, she's just done a great job. Let's give her a round of applause. And you know, part of Cross, Crosswinds Green Services, and. Um, <coughs> We just have a little going, well, it's, I wouldn't even call it a going away gift because we're going to still be here. Okay. So, thank Aww. you very much for your service. Oh, thank you. Okay. So, really, what we're going to do, we went through our, our, our meeting. Um, I'm going to just introduce some people that we're very, very happy to have here, wherever they just went to. So, of course, we have Senator John Bumstead. Thank you. Uh, Clint did not make it. Clint Pollock, but he's the president of White River Steelheaders. Uh, Terry Clark is here, vice president. Clint is president. Terry's vice president of White River Steelheaders. Ray Schindler is chair of White River Watershed Partnership. Did I say that right? Yeah. Eric Elgin, MSU Extension. And what's the edit? How do you say that? And limbled. What is your title? Limnologist. Okay. What else? <laughs> and water resources educator. All right. Thanks. Mike Gallagher, treasurer of Michigan Lakes and Streams Association. Uh, Chelsea Wapsis is also with the conservation district, so she's also representing Muskegon Conservation District. Uh, Tamara Horn, is she here? Hi. Thanks a lot. And uh, she's White Lake Area Climate Activist. Did I say that right? White Lake Area Climate Action Council. Okay. Uh, and we have Debbie Hildebrand, a mayor of the city of Whitehall. Tom Lohman, mayor of the city of Montague. Jeff Mars Marsinkowski, did I say it right? Oh, yeah. Did I get it right? You got it right. Beautiful. He's the supervisor of Fruitland Township. George, D George D <coughs> Dufresne. Thank you. That's what I was about to say. <laughs> Trustee White River Township. And is Patty here? Hey, Patty. Patty Sargent, she's the clerk of White River Township. Is Amy Van Loon here? She was going to be here. She might be here. Is she? Hi, Amy. Amy is the executive director of White Lake Area Chamber of Commerce. She's brand new at it. <laughs> Ryan Briegel is here, a past commoner of White Lake Yacht Club. Thanks. Thanks for coming. Bob Dykstra, sales representing Tannery Bay. And Greg Hildebrand, co-owner of the Lewis House. <clears throat> Thank you guys for coming. I really appreciate it. Thanks. So, Senator Bump said, I'm going to turn it over to you. Real quick, huh? Yeah. Thank you. Well, he said I don't. Is that better? It's better. Is that good? Yeah. Good. Thank you. 
good to see a whole room full of people that care. It's important. But anyway, they invited me here tonight to talk a little bit about what's in this year's budget and a bill that I have coming out that I hope we work on in this next supplemental. And it'll kind of, everybody has a copy of it. I'd like to go over it a little bit. But before that, you wonder why do I care about our drinking water, our, our where we live, where we play. Uh, I'm 64 years old and two months old. I've lived on the Muskegon River watershed on the Muskegon River every day of my life. My folks live on it. I've lived on it. I also serve on the Muskegon River watershed for the last six or eight years. When I originally ran for office, a lot of it had to do with water, outdoor recreation, state parks. Those types of things are very important to me, as it should be all of us in here, because we have such a, we're blessed with state parks, natural land, a lot of water. Uh, a lot of us make a good living off what we have in our environment. We just want to make sure we keep it and make it better than when we got it. So that's one reason I decided to run for office in the House many, many years ago. And when I was in the House and in the Senate, I've chaired the DNR budget and the DEQ budget. And I get along very well with both directors. Uh, the governor did a good job selecting them. And Dan Eichinger is DNR director, and Lisa Clark is the DEQ director. We don't always agree on everything, but they, they really do a nice job for us at the state. And I have a good working relationship with them. Because here's what I tell people. If you don't have that good working relationship with the directors, who remembers when they're eight or nine years old, one day you swore at mom and dad, and the next day you wanted an allowance? It works the same way in Lansing. So, <laughs> seriously. So if you, and they're all appointed by the governor, so if you sit there and insult the governor or directors, you don't get anything. So you, you just can't bring anything back to the district. I've always made it a good point in policy. My office, which is our office, we have very good staff, as Amy can attest to. Probably I, we have the best staff in Lansing. It's always been our policy, get along with the directors, get along with the governor, don't insult them on Facebook. You can help your district a lot more. It's just good policy and that's just good politics. So that's, and, and the outdoor recreation and the water issues are very, very important to me as they are to all of you, otherwise you wouldn't be here today. So I'd kind of like to go over a little bit what's coming up in next year's budget. Um, the Eagle budget includes, the 40, and that's already signed, 45 million for water infrastructure improvement grants, 20 million for environmental contamination rapid response team, 15 million for drinking water emergency assistance, 14.45 million for emergency funds to clean up PFAS. And that one's going to be real critical over the next few years. This whole PFAS thing is new to us the last half a dozen years. So uh, if we're going to need more funds in the future, we find an efficient way to clean PFAS, we're going to do it. So my theory is anytime there's a uh, environmental issues and it can be cleaned up, we need to find a way to do that, no matter what it is. And I, I don't, who would be opposed to that? Uh, 14.35 million for high water infrastructure grants to protect the shorelines. Uh, very critical, as, especially after the last few years of what we've seen along Lake Michigan. 13 million to administer the emergency dam safety grant program. Uh, that's just for the administration of it, and you'll see in my budget down, uh, the bill down here in Bill 565, uh, it'll explain why. Then I'll le read a little bit. Uh, I introduced introdu legislation to fund meaningful investment in our state's water infrastructure environment. Senate Bill 565 would invest $2.5 billion to strengthen our commitment to clean water. The bill invests in actionable items and uses as funding already and appropriated by the state by the federal government. These dollars are the federal dollars, the one-time dollars that we're going to get from the federal government. You know, everybody's got their hand out in Lansing. Everybody's represented by dozens and dozens of lobbyists. But I look at the bigger picture. How can we benefit our state for long term? And these types of projects, I mean, are very expensive, but we'll never be able to come up with this money from the federal government probably ever again. And how, do, how can we make it last and we get the most benefit and most bang for our bucks. And to me, it's when you can invest, I'll go right through it, $680 million for creation of grants and loan programs to prepare Michigan dams in critical condition. As we've seen on the east side of the state last year, what kind of devastation that can have if you don't maintain <coughs> or remove, so some, some of the money can be used for removal of dams, because on the Muskegon River watershed alone, there's almost 100 dams that could be removed. They're just small little <coughs> township dams or whatever. 
and they all affect the watershed. So a lot of that money can be used for removal, a lot of it can be made for maintenance on these dams. And some of these dams, we don't, we don't even know who owns them. So a lot of it is you know, finding out who owns them, who's going to be responsible for them if there is a failure. But $680 million is a lot of money, but it's not enough to do all of the dams in the state, but it's at least enough to go through and get a good idea where the, where the, in the worst shape. $600 million for replacement of lead pipes across the state. We all have lead pipes, every village, town, uh, large city. Uh, so we need to start addressing that. We all know the, how critical it is to get rid of these lead lines. $700 million to upgrade local drinking water and wastewater facilities. You know, I live in Nuevo. Their facility's been in for 35 years. They need two or three million bucks to bring up, you know, to replace their, their uh, liners. And almost every city and village has the same issues. So there's going to be uh, a 700 million for that. 85 million to ensure students have access to safe drinking water by installing filtered water stations. That was, we got asked that by almost a lot of the Southeast Michigan legislators. A lot of the schools are older. They don't know if there's lead lines in there. It's hard to go test every drinking, well, drinking station in all these schools, so it's easier just to come in and put in the drinking stations. Uh, 100 million to grant to address a harmful impact of PFAS chemicals at orphan sites. Uh, I mean, PFAS is, we're going to finding out it's everywhere, so we just got to, the orphan sites, airports, those types of things, um, it's everywhere. It's just, that's just going to get bigger and bigger. We just got to make sure there's, we, we fund those, those uh, the PFAS uh, problem that we have. 25 million to conduct surface water monitoring. This is one you'll all find pretty interesting. You know, 83 counties in the state, and some of the areas you think, well, Michigan has water all over the place. We have counties that don't ha they have no accessibility to water, even their drinking water. Over the years, it could have been through, you know, so many wells that have been put in in certain areas. It could, could be from farming, but a lot of it is, you know, you go down there, you know, a few feet, and there's a clay structure. It caps the groundwater, so the surface water does not make it to the groundwater, so it runs off. So there's a lot of there's a few counties in the state where they just you can't put a well and there's no water there. So we want to make sure we monitor the whole state. There's never been a program in Michigan to actually track and trace where water is, who's got it, and where it goes. So we want to make sure before we start doing a lot of legislation, we we need to have a map map that water. It's just like a road map. We need to have that road map for under our subsurface uh, drinking water. Uh, Ten million for wetlands mitigation. Say if somebody wanted to put a development or something along the lake shore here, it was in an area that was permittable. Sometimes the DEQ will come in, you know, to mitigate. It might cost you a hundred thousand or two hundred thousand dollars. This money can be used for that. Somebody can apply for the mitigation dollars. Um, 20 million to implement recommendations including the groundwater use advisory council report. 290 million in repurposed bonds to assist communities with upgrading and replacing water treatment infrastructure along with establishing a revolving loan fund for homeowners to replace failing septic systems. Uh, we have a lot of rural areas in the state where people come in, especially around some of the lakes and whatnot. They're old, old systems. And they might not have, you know, some of these systems you put in are ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000, very expensive. And we want to make sure there's a revolving fund for that. If people don't have the money out of their pocket, they're, they're able to access that, those dollars. And I think that's going to benefit all of us and the watersheds. Uh, and kind of in closing on that, clean, drink, clean drinking water and protecting our natural resources are not a partisan issue. It's not a Republican thing, it's not an independent thing, and it's not a Democratic thing. It should be for all of us, our kids, and our future. So I've been very aggressive over the last few years, <coughs> working with the departments, and you know, being on the watershed, I see the bigger issues. The conservation districts, next year we put several million dollars in there, for the, which is huge for the <laughs> conservation districts. We need that a lot, yeah. And they need, they've needed that for years, and because they do a great job. And uh, so there's, there's a lot of dollars in there that you don't see and you don't get a lot of press on it, but it's going to benefit uh, our, our, uh, our water for the years to come and be benefit our kids and our grandkids for long term. So a lot of times these one-time dollars, we want to make sure it's spent 
you know, actually where you can see the results. Because we're never going to probably get that kind of money again. But I would like to take some questions. And somebody's got to have one. Yes, sir. So I realize <clears throat> Senate Bill 565 has probably not been passed yet. It's just being proposed. Is that correct? Uh, it has a pretty good chance. Okay. So um, <clears throat> what I would be curious about is these are large numbers. How much of the Eagle budget and Senate Bill 565 is targeted for your district? Specifically targeted? Specifically. Actually, none of it specifically targeted. We wanted to make sure it was for statewide. That way I don't get complaints, you know, there is no, there's no projects in it. It's not project based at all. Because that's, I always have a problem with budgets. Uh, last year I was one of two people that didn't vote for the budget because there was fire barn, I mean there was hundreds of projects in there. I have a real problem with those types of things. This is specifically for the whole state. Everybody has a chance to apply. So is it first come first serve when money's gone, it's gone? It's, it'll be on how well the grants are written and how well it applies for the grants. But it, yeah, it's not specific because that it would that would not pass. Yeah. Uh, this is in your subcommittee right now. Is that right? Uh, this bill, the five sixty-five bill. Actually, it's in appropriations. Yes. In appropriations. Mm -hmm. How quickly can you get that moving out of here? Uh, that's the next supplemental. It'll be probably the next probably three weeks. Yeah. And if you do like what's in there, uh, give Senator Stamas's office a call and tell me you really like Senate Bill 565. Right. That does make a difference. Mm -hmm. yeah. But it, to me, if you're going to spend money, these are these are the types of month project we should spend it be spending on. Like I say, there's nothing in there for us specifically, but it, there's some things in there that will benefit West Michigan and the whole state. I also had in the budget uh, $600,000 last year and next year's budget, uh, even though it wasn't in there, uh, for maintaining watersheds. So watersheds can apply for the grant to do, a lot of times watersheds have money for projects and only like 5% of the money can be used for you know, office, you know, having an office and paying for bills. This, the $600,000 watersheds can apply for for maintenance and for doing office work and those types of things. That was in last year's budget and it'll be in next year's budget. John, that's for the whole state. Not just Correct. It's the whole state. The watersheds throughout the state. So that's something to remember. You don't get that money unless you ask for it. But that was another one. It's a really good program, but it wasn't just for our area. It's statewide. Is as to me, if you're going to do legislation, it should be statewide and be a fair, a fair process. That way, they can apply in southeast, UP, west side, east side, south, apply for those same dollars. You said um, for the surface water monitoring that you would need to conduct some mapping. How long do you think that process would take? Well, a lot of stuff is already, you know, your health departments where you apply for your, your water permits and that. A lot of the well drillers know where a lot of it is, but we have some areas that just have never been mapped very well. I would say it would, it'll probably take three, four years, but it, it is important we do that. That way, some communities are, you just, you know, if some, somebody wants to come in and put up a development with 500 homes and they don't have public water, well, they all need a well all of a sudden you can't get a well in, that's going to be a problem. So we need to know what's there, what's available, and how much should we use and permit accordingly. Because even though it might be a great building spot, if you can't drink water, you're either going to be shipping it in by somebody's going to be delivering it every day, which would be very expensive. So it's, before we do anything, it really needs to be mapped where the water is and how it's available. This Senate bill is just for inland lakes, nothing to do with Great Lakes, or is this both? Uh, both. It is. So yep. what are other states doing compared to what we're doing? Uh, I have no idea what they're doing with their federal dollars. My guess, blowing it. <laughs> <laughs> but to, to me, if you were actually look at these, they're pretty good projects in how it can be spent. How, how did you decide and prioritize? Uh, we have a lot of meetings with DEQ members throughout the state and our own House and Senate members. And this, uh, this was kind of a 
a priority in the Senate. You know, how can we help infrastructure in our water? And since I chair it, it was kind of my right up my alley. So we did we did talk to a lot of folks, a lot of communities, you small and, and large cities. It's important because they're going to have the same problems. It's you know their sewer systems need upgrading and how lead. How long have you been working on developing this plan? Uh, probably eight months. Yeah. Yeah, it does take a while to herd cats. Mm -hmm. right. um, so I wanted to ask specifically about our area, some of the impacts. You know, White Lake area's cold water streams are, are warming, and it's creating a situation where the young fish can't thrive. And then last summer, White Lake had, again, toxic algal blooms. And in, in August, the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change said we're in a code red for humanity situation. Was it the lake or the river? Or is it a combination of the both? The blooms, they were in the lake, is my understanding. Um, so I'm curious, like you mentioned, this is kind of a once in a lifetime uh, appropriations happening. What, what appropriations are available in Bill 565 to address climate change and its effects on water? I think a lot of it, like we mentioned, help funding the conservation districts is, is very important because like the conservation district in Nuevo grows thousands, millions of trees. So a lot of it is educating people on bank re, uh, uh, restabilizing the banks and you know a lot of people over the years over, they buy their house and had 100 feet on the river cut it all down. In fact he'll probably talk about that later. We were talking about an issue in Nuevo County that has that same problem. So it's warming the water. It's, a lot of it's just education, educating folks on you know, what you want to do might not be the best for the watersheds. So yeah, there's a lot of money in here for uh, uh, your lead lines and, and water replacement systems and whatnot. But a lot of the other, some of the issues you're talking about, we need to work hand in hand with MSU Extension and the conservation districts to get out and educate folks on here's best practices. But there isn't a specific portion that's for education, right? No. No. Nope. You know, one of the key things I think that would help the state is if the state would ban the use of uh, for fertilizers, would get rid of the fertilizers that have phosphorus in it. I think that would be a big deal. I've lived all over the country, and the places in states that have really banned it near watersheds, things like that, for people who want their nice lawns, but mm -hmm. not have the, uh, have the zero in the phosphorus would be a huge, huge mm -hmm. help. And that, that hasn't occurred yet, so that's a complication. Because we get a lot of phosphorus blooms in Indian Bay in the summer. Our waterfront's never really clean. Indian Bay's? Yeah, we're in the northwest corner of White Lake. Over here, okay. And uh, we're seeing all kinds of foam, bizarre stuff, just in the last three or four years, but I know a lot of it's phosphorus. I've seen more new homes developed on the waterfront. They all want these pretty green lawns and thing, things like that. And they can easily get high phosphorus mm -hmm. fertilizers for their yards. And of course, it runs off right to the lake. Um, the other thing, too, is I would like to see the Muskegon Conservation Group, or all of them in the state, um, have a little bit more bite when it comes to getting rid of like invasive species, things like that. Specifically, um, a few years ago, they came around to everyone on the White Lake area to get rid of the Phragmites. That was it's all over the place in the eastern part of the country. And it's like, uh, but it was an option for people to pay just a little bit of money for these people to go and do a fantastic job in removing it. And there were some people that were able to opt out, and it really doesn't benefit us as a whole if we're going to talk about the state, everybody counts, everybody matters. I'd like to see more bite where it's going to happen, and here comes the bill. I mean. It would just, oh. Um, we are, we did just receive a grant to do uh, frag mining treatments on White Lake. Yeah. Um, I don't know the cost of it right now, um, but we'll start surveying uh, this fall and through the winter and start next summer for treatments. Um, I think in the past people had to pay out of pocket for a large chunk yeah, of it. And I it think it's, much. I think it's um, a smaller amount this time, so it might help people. Uh, that's a hand process to too, isn't it? Oh yeah, they, they have to do it by hand. Um, we yeah, we use a chemical spray. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we lucked out because you guys they did it before the high water really got up there, and it, it hasn't returned in our bay at all. But you can see certain sections in certain areas 
where the people didn't uh, remove it, and it's, it'll just come back real quick. Yeah, so, you have to do it all, or yeah, yeah. So those things are frustrating. You know, you want to talk about spending money properly in government. That's that's got to happen. And some of the problem you see, especially at the local level, we were talking about that earlier too. I was on the, uh, uh, what's the right word? Brooks Township. The Brooks Township uh, Planning Commission, that's what. It, and we put it into place, how many years ago was that, six, eight years ago? Probably eight. Probably eight years ago, before I was in office, maybe close to ten. A nice, if you want to do a, a deck or something in Brooks Township, pull a permit, here's what you had to do, it was 30% or 40% reclaim the lake shore. It was a nice... Well, new elected officials got in and eliminated it. So it was working for a few years, and they just, new people come in, well, we don't like that, it takes away rights. So now they're back to square one, and nothing's there anymore. So you'll probably talk about that. Yeah, it was, it, I thought we did a great service to the, good service to Hess Lake and Brooks Lake, but now it's gone. A lot of it's just different boards come in every few years, and this was bad, now it's good. This was good, now it's bad. I've seen a hand up back there. Thank you. Do you feel our state is prepared for the developments we're currently seeing with climate change? Um, Tamara mentioned the site on the bacteria in the lakes, but the foundations on schools and buildings are failing due to water and then also vector borne disease. So all of these are related to water. Are we prepared? What, what was the last? The, what? Vector borne disease. I think we're getting more aware. A lot of it's education. See, some of the problem you run into with Lansing is you have two-year limits in the house. So every two years, you have to educate 50 more people that are making the laws for everybody in the room. And there's, there's good things to that, and there's bad things. The bad thing is there's no history. So they don't remember what anybody did two months ago. So it's like it's constantly changing You know what you think is good now to help out the state. This group might not think that way. So it's, it's an education thing back to working with making sure your groups know who your legislators are, have them on speed dial when things come up, and work together to find the best solutions for your areas. Because it's different kind of throughout the state, uh, you know, wh how, what you can be working on. But it's really knowing your legislators, having a conversation with them, and making sure you have their cell phone numbers. Because it's very important they hear from you. When, you. when your legislators hear from you on issues, they, they, they should be listening. So it's, it's, really up, it's really important you do that, because our office will do that. We write down everybody that calls the office. Uh, we save that if it's a call or an email. I have them from even when I was in, we saved them all. So we just want to make sure, you know, if there's things we can work on together to fix, fix issues, we need to do that and fund them. But a lot of, lot of folks throughout the state have no idea who they're, if you ask them who's your legislator, they'll have no idea. And a lot of that has to do with term limits. They're in and out so fast. Six years in the House, you know, you're in your, your third term, you think you know a lot, and you're just getting to know, and you might be a different governor too. It could be you go from a Rick Snyder to Governor Whitmer, different administrations, different priorities. So a lot of things have to do with the governor's priorities and who they appoint for the directors. So it's, it's always changing. For the grants that are in the in the bill, are, are they matched grants or are they? Some of them are. So all that information, uh, you'll have to call, call. We can get that information for you when when it passes. And for the loans that are in there, low interest loans to the OMRC, mm -hmm. how, how is that rate based? I do not know. That's something that uh, Treasury will take care of. Anytime there's grants, and what tre Treasury handles that. I'm not the banking expert. I just have these ideas in my head. Do you have another one of those sheets? I've got some. Yeah, I've got some over here. Yeah, you can copy these and hand them out to folks. But if we can get that Senate Bill 565 done, supplemental done, it'll be great. How does the PFAS affect people? Well, you know, I mean, I've heard, the, the, but I've never researched it. I've never looked at this. That's this. Yeah. This is really ongoing and new. Uh, it can't be good for you, but we're not sure yet how it's bad for you either. But any time uh, it moves so fast too, so it's basically hooking people up to to a public well, to public service is the best way to handle it right now, and making sure we don't keep using it so and it's not in our products anymore. It's moving so fast. I mean, how do you mitigate 
the orphan sites if they're if they've been in place if the orphan sites have not been known about for 30 40 years and they've been sitting there leaching this stuff out so how do you mitigate you, you have, I think that you have to do you have to do that you have to put in a system there's actually it could be going in Muskegon might be one of the first test areas on a new system uh, some of this money could be available for those folks to apply for. It's, and DEQs all, also, they don't know how to actually clean it up very well either. It's, there's just not a good way to do it. So uh, they're not sure if it's going to be airborne, if there's something you add to it where it settles down and it, it can't be bothered. So that it's going to be a lot of research and development over the next few years. Because, yeah, it, it does spread. It spreads fairly fast. But if we can find a way to mitigate it, if it's like, you know, a magnet, pulling on, on metal, that type of thing. So there's going to be a lot of tests coming up. Uh, in the, around the airports in Muskegon, there's PFAS everywhere. And it seems like we keep, we keep pay, helping people pay to hook up to the water system, which is the best way right now and the only way to actually you know, get safe drinking water. And some areas are, are, are worse than others. Just depends which way the water flows. That's another reason of doing the uh, groundwater study and finding which way the water goes because of pollution too because we just don't know. So I, think, I think the mapping is really key right now. Find which way they go. You would think Ottawa County has a lot of water in it. You know, Ottawa County is one of the largest, it's actually the fastest growing county in the state. And there's areas you can't get any water in the well. There's just no water available. So, <laughs> putting a well down four or five hundred feet is not not the way to go, and plus it's awful water. In fact, it's so, some of the wells are so deep. Roger Victory, Senator Victory, who sits behind me, they, they grow a lot of vegetables in Ottawa County. He says we can't even use the water for spraying our vegetables. It's just got too many chemicals, it burns it. Is it phosphate? Is salt. Salt? Yeah, it just salt, burns it right up. Into the, yeah. Into so that's what we need. We really need to map our system, just like a road map. We need to know what's under the ground. Because of, because of things like PFAS and every other chemical known to man. What I tell people, uh, over the years, the last especially 100 years, we as humans have really screwed up a lot of things. Because back in the old days, behind the company, you just took your five gallons of stuff and threw it out back because you don't see it anymore. It's gone. We're dealing with that today. So, But anyway, if you ever have any questions... Yeah, one more in the back. Right. <coughs> Around here, we have a lot of problems with groundwater contamination from old chemical companies, mm -hmm. as you know. Mm -hmm. And there are places that are, uh, well, Comores, um, the old Dupont, wants to sell the property, and uh, we feel that it's unsafe to have anybody drop a well into unsafe water. Could any of this, even though it says PFAS, could it be used for other chemicals as well? Uh, I'm sure if there's chemicals there that are, we can clean up, we, there's grants available throughout this, for, for the state. It's like down in Muskegon, you've got the old marathon site. That's almost done, by the way. Just about finished cleaning that spot up. I think another should be done this year, I'm, I'm thinking. So yeah, there's there's dollars available. Just there's so many places in Michigan, and there's just not enough companies or enough dollars to do them all at once. So we need to kind of pick and choose, even though it doesn't sound right. That's what we almost have to do now. Like uh, is that Bear Lake in the north northern North Muskegon? Mm -hmm. There's over like 200 oil and gas wells there years ago that were capped, and every once in a while one of them will pop up its ugly head, and you just don't know where they're at. They know where some of them are, but not all of them. When they were working downtown at the, the new uh, uh, convention center, they ran into one. And it was an old well, they didn't know it was there, nobody knew it was there, they, they called us up, the project got stopped overnight, and they needed a grant from the state. We were able to get them a grant within a week, <coughs> normally it takes a year, because it, it basically stopped that project. So we got, had a specialty company come in, cap it, it was four or $500,000, but at least it was fixed. And you run it, you're going to run into that a lot in, in certain areas, especially that area, because there's a lot of wells. 
a lot of them were capped with a rock or somebody stuck a stick in it. I mean, they're not professionally capped by any means. It, it, it could be a mess down the road. So those are the type of issues that pop up. You just, we've got to be prepared for. Yeah. It's, uh, some of these sites are really ugly. The one up in uh, Mansalona, there's a plume there that's, three years ago it was 14 trillion gallons of water that are polluted. And that's all headed to uh, Torch Lake. So, and they're hooking water wells up as, as, it, as the plume grows. And that's the only cure right now is just keep hooking. They hope time it gets to Torch Lake, it'll be spread out enough. It won't be as bad, but right now if somebody puts a well in there and wants to build, they got to hook up to city water, even though they're 14 miles from the city. So that's, that's one of those deals 50 years ago, you just threw it out back and no, hey, you don't see that anymore. We've, it's all gone now. So we're paying for that now. So John, it's very important that we teach our children. Correct. Because we're about gone. Correct. So they're going to be. Yeah, it won't matter for you and me. No, it's it's our saying. great great grandchildren. Yes. So I'm yeah, all. Yeah, anytime yeah. we can clean up sites that are as a chemical, we can clean up. You know, we, we need to find the money that can do that. No matter where it's at in the state or in the country, as far as that goes. And this these dollars get a, get us a long way to helping a lot of that. Yeah. Thank you. Also, White Lake, actually one of the tributaries on White Rivers start on my property. Flint and Crick, northeast of White Pond. So I do have a connection with you guys. <laughs> and that's really clean. You can, go, you can drink the water out of the creek. There's nothing in it. <laughs> Maybe deer poop. <laughs> well, Senator, thank you very much thank for you. coming. I know you're a busy guy. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Cool. Is that Mike Kordecki? It is. We've been trying to get together for two years to have a drink. I invite him to a meeting and he shows up to a meeting. You Do you know who he is? This yeah, guy owns Pub One Eleven, the landings, mm -hmm. uh, Blue Moon, he just bought the rooster. Yep. Yeah, I think he owns half the restaurants in Muskegon County now. I'm and he does a good job. Septic tank. Thanks for coming. <laughs> Thank you. You know, Mike, one. there's some extra chairs over there. That's fine. I'm oh, good. Yeah, like for those of you who are I try. Yes. Um, on behalf of the White Lake Association, John, thank you so much for taking time. I think Happy to be schedule. here, because this is my, my stuff. I like this. Well, we'd like, you, we'd like to present you with a White Lake Association oh. shirt. We hope you wear it proudly. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes. Okay. I'll wear it. Don't Come back and large. visit us again. Thanks. So now we're going to talk just in general what White Lake Association does because a lot of people think all we do is we monitor the lake and that, that, is, that is the most important thing that we do and we're going to get into detail about that but we do many 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 other things and saying that we need many many volunteers I don't want to do this for the rest of my life I want to retire one of these days so we're really encouraging people to volunteer we've got a sheet out there you can sign your name we really have a good time doing what we're doing we've got a, a, a fab, fabulous group of people but I want to get more people on, on, on different chairs I mean I want we're going to have to replace this board sooner or later, or otherwise it's gone. And we do a lot of great things. So if you're interested, there's a sheet over there to sign. So in general, we monitor the lake, and we test for a bunch of stuff. And I'm just going to say a bunch of stuff now. We'll get into the detail of what the bunch is. And we're going to ask Eric Elgin to come up and work with Chelsea on some detail, okay? We also, from time to time, we actually rake the lake. You see that rake over there? Yes. We throw that into the water, pull up plants, and identify if they're invasive or they're natural. And there are there are sheets over on the table that specify and show you photos of what invasive plants look like. So you know down down at the other end of the lake, um, in the lighthouse, there's a webcam there. You know you can get on your phone, your cell phone, and you can get on that webcam and you can go all around the lake. That's ours. That belongs to the White Lake Association. We manage that. Also down at the end of the lake, there's a weather station. These guys that go out fishing, they're looking at that all the time. That's ours. And um, actually, we have a company by the name of, we couldn't take care of it ourselves anymore. It got to be a big deal. So we hired a catch mark to maintain these uh, through a contract, and they do a great job for us. Next, thanks to my <coughs> wife a few years ago, um, we have a life jacket loaner program. Do you 
feel comfortable talking about yeah, that? Yeah, um, just, just briefly, several years ago we were in Florida boarding with friends and there was a launch ramp and there was this stand with life jackets and it was the first look we'd ever had it. Wow, that is so cool, what is that? So the next day we drove our car over to this launch ramp and it's a lot of signage, who's sponsoring it, where it comes from, um, and it's CETO Foundation in conjunction with the Coast Guard. And so we contacted CETO because um, we thought it would be perfect addition for White Lake. And then we wrote a grant and it was approved. And um, so we have 48 life jackets for the first one and they sent the big steel stand. That's the one that the photo down there is mm -hmm. over at the Montague launch ramp. And a year or two later we applied for the same program, another grant for the Scenic Drive launch ramp. That was approved. We got 48 more life jackets. We've got a lot of life jackets. Jeff Ott, former president of White Lake Association and of course city manager in Montague, um, is behind the program 100% and he lets us store all these life jackets in the band shelf, which is very nice of him. And it's better than our garage. So uh, it, they're being used. It's, the program is a success. We've only lost we're missing three from the whole season. Of 100? Well, people may have them on their boat and they forget to take them off when they come back. So <coughs> they might show up again next spring. But it's been a, a great program. We're very, very proud of it. And she's being very modest. Every week she goes out and counts them. <laughs> she takes them home and cleans them. <laughs> yep, and she determines if they're still usable. If they're not, you know, we, we, get, we get rid of them. From time to time, some very nice people will who donate theirs and then just put them out there. We can't use them. You know, they're not Coast Guard approved and so we have to just ditch them. But that's, that's very thoughtful. It's a very successful program. Thanks. Um, so next down at the Scenic Drive launch ramp in partnership with Fruitland Township, steel headers, um, we've got a dock there. And uh, thanks to Terry Clark, he maintains it fixes it. Last year it was vandalized. It was pulled out about eight feet and really destroyed. Uh, Terry fixed that all up again. Um, the way we cover the cost of that, down at that launch ramp there's a, there's a little donation jar and people put money in it. We keep that as, on a separate line item that we use just for maintaining that. Um, that's, that's another thing that we do. And uh, thanks, thanks again for your help. I think we're going to eventually have some security cameras and some lighting yes. up there, right? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Next is the no wake buoys. And I'm just going to give you some background on that. This goes back years ago. At some point in time, somebody thought maybe, and maybe it was White Lake Association. It goes back this far. We're about 25 years old. Somebody wanted no wake buoys. And so, you just don't put no wake buoys out there. You have to have an ordinance. And I don't know if you've noticed around the lake lately, there's no wake buoys. You can't do that. You're not allowed to do that because of an obstruction to boaters. Those, buoy, those buoys are, are, put, are marked by the DNR. They're GPS. They're GPS. And those ordinances are really owned by Fruitland Township, White River Township, the city of Whitehall, and the city of Montague. It's their ordinances. But somehow down the line, White Lake Association said, oh, we'll take care of it, and we did. But those things, uh, first of all, they're plastic and they dry out and they fall apart. People hit them with boats, people steal them, people move them in other directions. And we were found, uh, Mike Tromley heads us up and we were finding that they're really only good for about four years, right? Something like that, yeah. yeah. Uh, Terry Clark used to handle that, and Terry invited me to go out a few years ago on his, on his fishing boat. Those buoys weigh, what do they weigh, about 70 pounds? At least. With 30 chain pounds of chain, and how much do the how much do the concrete blocks weigh? Another 40 pounds. I, I hurt myself lifting them so, up last time. Yeah, well, actually, <laughs> what we did, we, we we deploy them off of a boat at a certain GPS location, and then that's that's the easy part of throwing them over. It's taking them out. We're full of zebra mussels, gunk. It's a it's it's horrible. And then we get people complaining around the lake, oh, you know, the buoys are a mess. Oh, this one's not what it's supposed to be. Well, this one's missing. It really had to be a pain. 
Um, so I did some research, and then I did find out that these ordinances are actually belong to the city and the townships. And so we went to the townships and asked them if they would, if we would create a fund to replace these buoys from time to time. And and they've done that, and it's been great. So what I'd like to do now, can we get into some detail about? We can you help us, Eric? Okay, sure. come on over. Is there any any? I think that Patty, did you have some questions on the no way buoys? Um, yeah, I wanted to know who decides where they go. They, they, they're GPS by the, that's a, the DNR did that years ago. Okay. Now, and what we've done, and we're not supposed to do it, um, and we work with the sheriff on this, they're, it's hard for boaters to see them because of the way they're spread out. Very hard to see. Technically, you don't even need them. It's an ordinance. You don't have to have a no way sign up there. But we do for the benefit of boaters. But what we did this year, um, thanks to Mark, we moved the men a little bit closer. So but we're not supposed to do it, but we did it anyway. And I think they're GPS now, aren't they? I'm not sure. I'm yeah. And Matt and Dan. Yeah. Yeah. And so I'm going to go. So Mark has this up, but there's there's a couple of guys that put them in and take them out for free. Um, Dan McCormick of South Shore Marine. Yes. And Matt, Ar Matt Dalrymple. Matt of uh, Armstrong's. They do it for free. They put them in, they take them out, they store them. And that's not e easy. That, now it's better than the way it used to be with, when Terry did it. I mean, these guys have work boats with cranes, so it's easy for them to just, just pick them up. Pat, that, does that answer your question, Patty? Yeah. Um, I, 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 I will add that where they're at right now is not where they're supposed to be, no. at Indian Bay or Indian Point. Um, it, They've, they've gotten dragged or the waves have picked them up and moved them. Uh, I went out and checked them today and they're not exactly, they're, they're the ones at Indian Bay are supposed to be about where the green bu navigation buoys are. Okay. Um, but they've gotten moved. We've had a lot of complaints. People say, we come through the channel, we get out of the channel, then we see the no weight buoy after we've accelerated and the sheriff's there and he pops. Hmm. Well, there's supposed to be two of them out there by each green buoy. But again, if there's a storm, sometimes it, it means they're just hanging there by concrete blocks. Mm -hmm. sure. And if there's a heavy storm and it moves into deeper water, now they're almost floating. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's a constant management problem. I think we need longer chains, <coughs> probably more weight. Um, we're going to talk about that. We're gonna, yeah, <laughs> we're, we're going to talk about that. But we, you know, again, we're going to need your support on that. Okay. <clears throat> Do they revisit the location of those on some kind of an annual basis? I'm sorry? I understand they're located via GPS. Yes. Does the DNR relocate those or review the location on an annual basis? It, no, uh, no. In fact, I talked to Jeff Ock because we actually wanted to get them relocated. And he said, ah, it'll take you years and years and years <clears throat> to get it done with them. Just do it. <laughs> And we weren't supposed to, but we even cleared it with the, with the sheriff and, and the city. But to answer your question, no, they always stay right where they are, supposedly. Okay. Anybody else? Okay, so now we're going to get into detail what we do out there. I just drive the boat, that's all. <laughs> and my wonderful group here, they do all the work. But we're going to do some demonstrations and tell you what it all means when we do all these different things, what it means, how we put it all together. <laughs> Is it Chelsea going to lead since you have the specifics and then I'll follow up with what they all mean and stuff? Is that what you Yeah, that works for me. Oh, that like that. Yeah, that's great. Um, so we do a handful of uh, sampling throughout the summer. Um, a lot of it depends on what time of year. Oh, I'm over here. Um, so we do a spring and summer phosphorus sample. Um, usually the spring one is just after ice out. And then the summer <coughs> one is in September, um, late fall, early fall, I guess that would be. Um, and we don't have the stuff for that. Those are just water samples that we send in over to them, and then they take care of the rest of that. Um, what Dave has in his hand is called a Secchi disc. Um, that measures the clarity of the water um, throughout the year. That changes a little bit depending on temperature and um, all of that. Uh, so we lower it down. Um, this is. Uh, metal, some of them are fiberglass uh, disc with the white and black. Um, it's supposed to be so you can see it, uh, you measure, lower it all the way down um, until you can't see it anymore. 
bring it right back up to right when you can, and then that's the clarity. Um, how deep down you can see. It's a pretty so easy one. So we measure two areas of the lake. This is a big lake for an inland lake. So it's actually called two lakes. There's a, there's a, a west side and an <coughs> east side, and the west side is at Long Point, and the east side, it, what's that called? We're it's just outside, right outside of where Oxy. Yeah, and we That's always use those same two locations, always, always, always. And you're in 50 feet of water, 55 feet of water, mm -hmm. it depends. Um, the clarity really varies because if there's a storm and then you measure two days later, it's not going to be clear. If it's after a big weekend and there's a lot of boating, it's not going to be clear. This year, the lake was really clear. Westford. It doesn't mean it's clean, it just means it's clear. That's why you put all these things together. So again, you, you deploy this off the boat, and you measure from the water surface to where you just can't see this anymore. Kind of subjective if you have terrible sight. <laughs> oh, two feet. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's but uh, it's been around yeah. about, what, this year? It was running yeah. 10 feet, 8 yeah. feet. And yeah, I think we got an 11 foot at one point, which was kind of shocking. All of us were like, wait, are we reading that right? That doesn't. But uh, for the most part, we're between like 3 to 6. Uh, normally, we got a crazy 11 foot one uh, in like July, I think, or June or July. Um, at the same time that we do that, we do um, what's called a DO reading, dissolved oxygen um, and temperature. We invested uh, in this um, meter earlier this, well, last year. Um, we've borrowed some in the past uh, with another lake association. We invested in our own this, uh, this time. This dis uh, measures the dissolved oxygen of the lake. So we take uh, the measurement of how deep the lake is at that point. And every so many feet, we measure how warm it is and what the dissolved oxygen is. Um, the closer to the surface, you're going to have a little more because you're getting more oxygen turnover. Uh, lower down, you get there's like no plant life down there in that kind of area, so it gets really low. Um, there is still a little because we're just the water's moving, um, but for the most part, it's it's pretty low. So we keep track of all of that as well. Um, I think we do that twice a month. Yep. So uh, I think there's probably at each location we would, would go down about 12 different areas, from one foot all the way down to um, just above. Where we at? We don't go. We don't hit the bottom because it'll gunk up this. So if, it, if we're in 50 feet of water, we'll drop to 45. Mm -hmm. And so again, when you start out, the water's warmer. There's more oxygen. That's what's supposed to happen. As you get lower, you start to lose these readings. What you don't want to happen is at the top to have more oxygen because then you won't have any life, right? So that's what this thing's all about. Yep. So. Uh, oh, uh, and so as she mentioned that we used to kind of rent this from the state, um, and then. A couple of years ago, or last year, our, our governor cut off the funding. So nobody was doing any monitoring on the lake, except us. The reason why we were doing it, because of your membership, we had the money to do it. We went out and bought this meter. It's 1500 bucks. These other little lakes, lakes, they couldn't do it. They didn't have the money. But thanks to our membership, we were able to do that. I would like to add that all of our testing results are available on our website, mm -hmm. whitelakeassociation.org. Uh, under testing results. So, yep. and at the end of the month here, I'm about to send all of the data that we took uh, over to Eric and his team, and they're going to process it all, and then we'll get a report back in the spring that we'll put up on the website that will give you all of the readout from uh, them this year. And then just briefly on membership, about five or six years ago when I got involved, our membership was about 147. Um, that was okay, but we did a, a campaign. We have 230 members. And thank you all for that. We really appreciate it. And I would like just to quickly with the funding. Please. So now we do have a five-year contract. With the state yes, of that's right. In a partnership with the state of Michigan, with specifically the Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy, with the Michigan uh, Lakes and Streams Associations, MSU Extension, the Huron River Watershed Council, and let's see, I think that's all. There's a partnership of us that are working statewide to implement this, and it's been going on since the 70s. I'll talk a little bit more once we're all done with this. Yeah. But we have a five-year contract now, so it's, yeah. Yeah. it's in. That's great. Um, you let's want to see. show them how, that, how the fall, how yeah. you, what you do this, with that This uh, last one is, uh, we use this for chlorophyll. <coughs> um, there's a weight, it's, it's just a soup can. <laughs> 
with a weight in the bottom and then this plastic jug comes out. Um, we lower this down to a specified depth. It's very loud. Um, based on our clarity at that spot, then we lower this down based on that. Um, this collects some water. We bring it back to um, the house and run it through a filter. Um, and then that filter captures all of the chlorophyll. And sometimes you can really tell when it's been stirred up and it's really mucky looking. It's bright green. It's kind of cool. But um, <laughs> we freeze all of that and we send it all in um, in October. And they'll let us know kind of what our chlorophyll levels are for um, that month. And I think we do that two times or once a month um, from May ish until September. Um, so that and then what am I missing? We do the um, exotic aquatic plants um so that rake we like dave was saying we throw it out toss it into the lake pull it in while you're holding onto the rope <laughs> while you're holding on the rope yeah and then you see sometimes what, it slips <laughs> and then we examine if it's invasive if it's natural if she can do it with her eyes closed she just knows this stuff yeah yeah we've uh, there's a handful of um, plants that are on the watch list, so we're keeping an eye out for them. Um, quite, there's a couple that we know we have in the lake already. I think every, it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a couple that we are still keeping an eye out on and making sure. Um, I know it's in, there's some in areas around us, so with boats traveling in and out of lakes, um, it's a really big deal, which is why it's really important to wash your boat off before you go to another lake. Um, and Am I missing that? No. Oh, Is that everything I've, we do? No, you did. But what I'd like you guys to do, so what does it mean? Yeah. I'm going to leave it up to you. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to. What does it all mean? What here. does it all mean? That's a big question. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll kind of, the this program that White Lake is a part of, they've been a part of for, for many years. Uh, a friend of the White Lake, part of the board, I think Tom Tissue was doing it for years. I'm glad now it's continuing on. So the Cooperative Lakes Monitoring Program is a statewide program that's been going on since the early 70s. And that's key because this is a long-term volunteer program. So Michigan has 11,000 inland lakes. So bodies of water over five acres. There are not enough biologists, ecologists, scientists to study all of those. And so it's like the power of the people. We, can, we go out and educate the public riparians, so folks who live around lakes, people who love lakes, and then uh, we, we educate them on all of these different parameters. And then, uh, and then we, we train them what do they mean, how to do it, and then uh, we have different protocols in place, and then we, we give the data. And now it's key is that it's not a snapshot, because that's what happens frequently, because there's only those handful of ecologists out there in the state agencies and federal agencies, so you get snapshots. But now what you can do, so that, that helps a bit, Okay, we can tell you in 2021, this is what's happening in White Lake. But it doesn't necessarily help us understand trend lines. We have folks interested in climate change, for example. How is it changing through time? We don't have our chemical companies here anymore. How are we seeing changes with that? Or land use is changing. And so long-term data is critical. Um, and so it's great to know that the, the data is uh, online and the White Lake Association. But you can also get the raw data in our Cooperative Lakes Monitoring Program website. So you can look at all the data that White Lake has ever collected, or any of the lakes that have collected. We've had a, around 1,000 lakes through the course of uh, the years collecting data on their lakes. So it, it's pretty spectacular. And you know, it's funny. You wouldn't, th you wouldn't think this is how we collect scientific data, right? <laughs> <laughs> we have a product, we, we tell you that you cut off, you go to your hardware store, cut them off, you know, put the eye bolt in, all these things. But this is actually what we use. So the, this isn't just for citizen scientists. This is good, this is data that is comparable. So we have, uh, we, we actually go out and collect data on some of these like side by side with our volunteers to make sure the data quality is what it should be. And it is, every time we look at it, uh, and we compare uh, across the state its quality data. Um, what does all of this mean? It's tough. Uh, everything shows something a little differently. The, uh, so that chlorophyll, that's algae. So 
and we collect it from that top surface of the water, not just the very surface because it's the photic zone. So that's the light can penetrate only so far into the water and we're collecting all of the algae in there, uh, in, in that spot. Um, and we don't dif differentiate between, so algae are normal and natural in lakes. There's tons of species of, of algae in our water. And now you know, in the news, for good reason, we're starting to hear about harmful algal blooms or cyanobacteria or blue-green algae, all talking about the same thing there. And we don't differentiate in our program, but it can still give you some indications. And then when you talk to us, that's, we're always present to help. So if you see a green scum that looks like paint that's been spilt out on your lake, or it's starting to turn bluish, like bright fluorescent blue, you call us and we give you that node to help you talk to the correct state agency or so on and so forth <coughs> to, to move forward on that. Um, I want to, so this about aquatic plants, I do want to mention some, some highlights here. So Eurasian water milfoil and curly leaf pondweed are the two invasive species, aqu uh, submerged aquatic plants. So this is one in the water and below. Those are the two that White Lake have. There's one that's up and coming that is currently in Pentwater Lake, Lincoln Lake, so that's just a bit further north, and then uh, the lower Grand River, and that's called European Frogbit. So this is a newer species. It's <coughs> been over on the east side of the state in the coastal wetlands of Lake Erie and Lake St. Clair and Lake Huron. And it was there for, for many years, but we didn't see it jump inland. But we've recently seen it jump inland. The first one was Reeds Lake in Grand Rapids uh, in 2016. And from 2016, now we've started seeing it pop into these other locations. And um, White Lake, we're starting to see a trend. Drowned river mouth lakes are getting it. Um, also, we are seeing a little trend if there's with uh, potentially waterfowl hunting, because that it may have moved from Lake Erie, you know, great waterfowl hunting, and accidentally moved to the Lower Grand River or uh, Pentwater State Game Area, great waterfowl hunting, and so there could be accidental movement of of this species. So I just want to mention European frogbit. It's a free floating plant that you would could hold in the palm of your hand. So just as people who live around the lake or enjoy the lake, you don't necessarily even need to be signed up for this program, just knowing, hey, that looks different. And that's something that you can contact the lake association about and then they'll know the pathway to me or some of the state agencies. Um, so, yeah, if, is there any questions about any of these parameters? Because I could talk forever. The secchi disc, you know, it seems crude, <laughs> right? We've been using it for hundreds of years across the world. And although people may think it's a little, uh, it seems subjective, it's actually not too bad. Uh, we can actually, the human eye, if it doesn't have sunglasses, can actually detect it pretty, pretty similarly between individuals. Um, you mentioned a website where we could look up the lake's data. Yeah. What's that website? Thank you, Mike. By the way, Mike Gallagher here, he is a member of the Cooperative Lakes Monitoring Program team. Uh, so, uh, mycore.net, M-I-C-O-R-P-S. So, M-I-C-O-R-P-S dot net. So, you can look at all the data there. We have a whole bunch of information on lake monitoring um, and who we are and what you can do. Um, and then also, just to there's enro open enrollment starting in the next like three weeks, two weeks. So we'll be open, open. Uh, and I think it's safe to say you guys will be <laughs> signing up again. <laughs> there's also stream data there too. Yeah. So yeah, I'll just broaden it off with that with that comment and the White River representation here. My core is actually a monitor, a citizen science monitoring program for lakes and for streams. And what's What's interesting about streams is that the types of invertebrates, the types of bugs that live in the water, the makeup of those can tell you a, a lot about the quality of that water. And so, a lot, and really well. And so, uh, we have uh, the second part of our MyCorp program, which is stream monitoring, where you go out and collect uh, invertebrates throughout a stream, and then that was calculated to tell you what, what quality is that uh, river at. And then also, I should mention, there's the third part, which is a stream cleanup. So if there are 
Um, and this could be not, a, it doesn't have to be a main stem, it could be any inlets or streams, any moving water, you can apply for a grant to help you clean up if there's a bunch of trash in it. And it's amazing what gets thrown into a river, or lake, or really any low depression, unfortunately. Just, <coughs> excuse me, a general question. Could you comment on the overall health of White Lake, and do you see it improving or decreasing over time? I haven't looked at the long-term data. I'll just go off of what I just heard <laughs> of, of this. So um, we, White Lake is at a great and unfortunate location in the watershed. Mm -hmm. It is receiving all of the water from the watershed. And with that, everything that's being collected within there. So what happens on land impacts the water. That's like the simple thing, right, that we can all really understand. And so here's this watershed, white, the white watershed, white river watershed isn't massive, but it's big. That's a lot of land. And so everything's coming into uh, White Lake. So that's, that's a lot. Now, uh, 10 plus on the Secchi in June, July, early July. Yeah. So that's great. Um, that likely happened because we were in really low precipitation uh, this year. So we weren't getting a lot of rain, which wasn't having runoff of the watershed off of the land and into the water. So you can ha get that. Um, in between three and six, it makes sense. I'm guessing it's better water qu uh, clarity near uh, Lake Michigan. Because what's happening there is things are being deposited. You know, the river's coming in, in this, uh, on this side of the lake here. It's depositing, you're getting a lot of algal growth and as you're moving further uh, away, it's now already deposited it as well as you're getting influence from Lake Michigan uh, coming in. So um, I would encourage, you could look, I'll look, have you looked at the long-term data? Is it? So it, it would be interesting to see, um, so I should, phosphorus was mentioned, and it was mentioned earlier today as well, uh, and some of the work that's being proposed would, would impact phosphorus. So phosphorus is important because it's, it's been found to be the most limiting nutrient to algae and plant growth in water. And what that means is, if I put in sulfur, which is a nutrient, into a lake, not much would happen. Because it's not limiting, it's already there. But if I put phosphorus in there, that's what was limiting the growth of those plants, and so they then explode. So that's, phosphorus is seen as the most important there. Um, and so I would, if you go to mycore.net, go into White Lake, I would, I'd be curious to look at is, is, are, we, are we pretty flat? Are we increasing or declining? Oh, yeah. This summer there was a noticeable odor and growth along the causeway um, between White Hall and Montague. Do you know what was happening there? No, I, does anyone have a, so I can give some thoughts, but does anyone have an actual? Yeah, so it could be, so certain algae can be, can give off an odor. Doesn't mean that's bad for you, but it could give an odor. Also, as the, so the water levels were starting to change here, and so we were getting some wetland exposed. Right. You know, the, there's new wetland, and then it was starting to get exposed, right. so we may have been getting some methane gas going out, and, and sulfur dioxide. There's a whole bunch of things that can happen when right. you have inundated organic matter, and then it, you can get some some gases, so that's a possibility. But I, I know what you're talking about. Sometimes this, I was like, "What is that?" It almost smelled like sewer. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But that would be my guess because I was thinking the same thing. But the water level was going down. What's that? Probably not preventable. <coughs> if it was what we just talked about with water levels and wetland, no, like that's just uh, a part of a part of nature, which sounds kind of funny, but that's. Isn't it just the rotting process? Yeah, and then the rotting pro decomposition releases gases, yeah. and then eventually those gases will release. But it's still kind of strange. I'll look into that, and then I'll communicate with the White Lake uh, Association to maybe get the <coughs> word out. Thank you. One other thing, on the MyCor website, uh, Dr. Paul Steen puts a summary of all the data for each individual lake that might it show uh, trends. Uh, yeah. The lake that my wife and I live on, um, we've been doing the CLMP program and monitoring for 10 or 12 years now, and 
it took quite a while before we started to see any type of a trend at all. And, but in the last few years, we can see a trend of a little less chlorophyll and a little less phosphorus, which is nice to see. And uh, from way back 30 years ago, there were some people that did the safety disk on the lake. That caused us to put in a sewer system because we noticed the lake was not clear like it used to be 50 years ago, maybe. And it's remarkable the change in the lake since the sewer system went in. It's expensive. But boy, oh boy, everybody's house value went up a whole lot more because they can see their toes when they're standing in the water tower. That's, by the way, is a studied fact. Uh, as water clarity increases, so do, so do property values. Could I ask one question? Do, when you guys go out and monitor on your lake, do you take anybody else with you? We like to. Love to. We love, love to. Love to. <laughs> you know, it's fun. Believe it or not, it's fun. It's a blast. It's a blast. It really is. I take so many people out. Only usually one or maybe two at a time with me. They come back and they are amazed at what they uh, enjoyed learning. And it's stuff that they were curious about, but they just didn't know. And that, like that safety <laughs> desk, I always tell them the story. I'll tell you what, if anybody can answer this question, I got a prize for you. Safety desk, who was it named after? <sighs> Father Angelo Seiki, the Pope, asked him to figure out the quality of the Mediterranean Sea. And he was a scientist in, at the Vatican. And so he asked this priest scientist, hey, figure out the quality of the Mediterranean Sea. And so he put that thing together. And that's what we've been using since yep. the late 1800s or something. And it is amazing to see oh, people excited about the Secchi disc. <laughs> it's, it's instantaneous data. And you know, people will put it on, on Facebook, and it's like looking at the weather. What's the lake yeah. like this week? We do, at, almost every time after I go out and we, we monitor the, the clarity, uh, we put it on Facebook to let everybody else in the Lake Association get hits to our website, lots of hits, because people are curious, they want to know. And uh, um, it, is there anybody who would like to go out with them? I got a packet for you that will uh, have some information. How do I identify aquatic invasive species? That's a hard thing to do. I mean, you got an expert right here who can look down in the water and know what it is. But the rest of us, we need this little book mm -hmm. right here to help us to do that. Is there anybody who would? Like to go out with them and, and, and monitor sometimes? We've got a, he already signed in. Yeah. That was great. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Mike, let me, thanks. It, we don't go out in inclement weather. I mean, we're volunteers. This is enjoyable. So if, if it's rough, we just cancel it. We don't, we're not going to go in a storm. We're not, not on a white light. <laughs> no, I don't, want to, I don't want anybody to get hurt. Yeah. I mean, we, we, we don't, don't want anybody to get hurt. We just cancel it and we move it to another time. But there are certain time slots and dates where we do have to cover certain certain areas. But it's really it's it's really enjoyable. We've got it down to where we leave crosswinds about ten in the morning and we're done in an hour, hour and a half, right? Yeah. And it's 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 really fun, it's educational. We have a ball. Yeah, it's a boat. So, yeah, we'd love to have you join us. Right. You know, that's right. So so a couple other things, if you don't mind, Eric. Yep, no, so that's good. People will ask me from time to time, so what's going on in the lake? Is it getting better? Is it getting worse? It doesn't change over a year or two years or three years or four years. You know, it takes a long time to see these changes. And then the question is, if there is a big change, they'll say to me, what do you do? We report. That's all we do is we report. It's what you do. If things really change, we're going to let you know. You're going to have to get together some committees, and you're going to try to get some funding and grant money to, to, to get it taken care of. Fair enough? Yes, sir. So I understand measurements at static points. So you get data that is uh, regularly measured and can be compared. But, and I can't remember the point you said that you measured, long point and... Uh, just outside of where oxy comes from. Oxy, so there's yeah. a couple points there. 
that again you get a lot of water flow from the regular river channel that flows through there. Mm -hmm. So um, when you go into bays like Indian Bay in particular and you get a nice southeast wind going, oftentimes we'll get algae the color of your formica mm -hmm. top or we will get white striations in the water. Is there a place that I can take a water sample and or take take a water sample from my shoreline trying to capture that and bring it to someone to analyze? Um, yes. So if you suspect that it's a harmful algal bloom because you're seeing a really weird colored algae on the surface, mm -hmm. um, actually call the Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy. So that's, that's formerly the DEQ. Mm -hmm. And they'll actually come out there and oh. collect. And the individual's name is Aaron Parker. Even. He's the biologist who's working around the state. Um, the white striations, you know, so. That's phosphorus. Probably, yeah, there's dissolved organic possible. matter typically uh, is what causes that. That's totally natural. Um, if there's potential evidence that there's PFAS contamination in the lake or in, in the watershed, um, that can also create a, a white foam, but it, and it looks like shaving cream. Like it's it's really more of a white. foam instead of just the stri stri yeah. striation. Correct? Oh yeah, that's, the striations are actually uh, Langmuir spirals. There, that's the uh, fun term. I was waiting for you. <laughs> you <waiting? laughs> it's actually pretty exciting to know that there's a, there's a. If you're ever out on a boat when there's wind and you see these striations all oh, yeah. in parallel, those are a phenomenon called Langmuir spirals. <laughs> Anyways, I feel kind of ashamed saying it for some reason. <laughs> but but no, it, for the PFAS uh, thing, because there is some contamination in the area. Um, if it's like white shaving cream, if really brilliant white. Um, that's something that, again, con contact an eagle. Okay. Um, and if you don't know who to contact an eagle, you can go to the association, you can contact me directly, or however it works. Okay, thank you. Okay. Are, are there any fishermen here? So, a few. So, fishing was not that great this year um, in a lot of places. In fact, my friend back there, Jack, Jack and I went up to Drummond Island to get walleye, and we, we used a guide up there, Charlie, guy who don't. You don't even pay me. You're not going to catch fish. Well, Clarity. Fish don't like to be seen. <laughs> People say, well, the water was too hot. The water was too cold. The water, it's, it was just really, really clear. A lot of charter guys were complaining about it. It's, it's just that it was so clear. So, you know, get both sides. Okay, well, thank you all. Wow, what a great turnout. Thank you for your membership. And if you don't belong, you just happen to have... <laughs> a self-addressed stamp envelope. No excuses. It's 35 bucks. That's all. We really need your support. And your volunteer yeah. spirit. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Senator Bum said, you're, I'm going to invite you to every meeting, man. I get, I get a big crowd this way. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, everybody.